Okay, I think we're going to get started. Uh, good morning again. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Open Textbook Network Summit. Thank you for joining us today for today's session for OER Learning Circles for Instructional Improvement. My name is Tanya Groves and I'm the Director of Educational Programs for the Open Textbook Network. If you're not familiar with us, we're a community of higher education organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open ed. You can learn, learn more about us at open.umn.edu forward slash OTN. I'll be serving as the facilitator for today's session, and I'm joined by Sarah Cohen, Senior Managing Director for the OTN, who will be moderating the Q&A, along with Karen Lawrenson, Director of Publishing. Before we begin, we'd like to share a few important details with you. The hashtag for the summit is hashtag OTN Summit 20. We are live tweeting our sessions, so please join us on Twitter at, at open underscore textbooks. The webinar is being recorded. The video and transcriptions will be posted on the Open Textbook Network's YouTube channel after the summit has concluded, as will uh, the slide deck itself. The last several minutes of today's session will be for questions. To submit a question for our presenters, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Questions are enough. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about community norms at z.umn.edu forward slash summit community norms. Please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. So thank you panelists. Thank you, Karen, for joining us. If you'd advance the slide deck, please, I'd love to introduce you. Dr. Karen Perkula is a psychology instructor at Central Lakes College in Brainerd, Minnesota, one of my favorite places on earth, by the way, and serves as the OER faculty development coordinator for Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. Her professional interests include instructional design, faculty development, student-centered learning, open educational resources, open pedagogy, online instruction, teacher attrition, student success, and research on the practices of successful 21st century colleges. Dr. Pakula holds an MS in education from Bemidji State and a PhD from Capella University in educational psychology. Thank you, Dr. Pakula, for being with us today to talk to us about your OER learning circles. Well, thank you, Tanya, for the nice introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. Well, first of all, I would like to thank Tanya and the Open Education Network for inviting us to share our experiences with you um, today about our OER faculty development learning circles. I would also like to thank each of you for taking time from your busy day to join us for this conversation. Today we have six faculty from Minnesota State who will be sharing their learning circle experiences with you. As you hear each of the six faculty introduce themselves and share their stories, please note their names and also any comments or questions that come to mind as you listen to them speak. We have reserved a nice chunk of time at the end of this session um, for each faculty to share or answer questions with you, for you, or if you want to share any comments. As you can see from this slide, we have found the OER Learning Circle model to be truly a model for success. The structure and process of the model offer faculty an opportunity to structure and organize their OER work in a resource-rich, cross-disciplinary, and cross-institutional collegial work environment. So first of all, I'd like to just quickly touch on the structure of the learning circle model. The learning circles are typically structured as 10 week sessions for semesters and five week sessions for the summer semester. The learning circles are structured around the three project pathways that you see here, course redesign, the authoring of ancillary materials or textbooks, and OER learning circle leaders practicums. Faculty meet for an hour per week in a virtual facilitated Zoom room learning circle meeting. Here faculty share a pearl, which is their aha or enlightenment moment from their work that week. 
They also share thoughts, ideas, questions, and great resources with, with each other. Faculty are expected to attend 80% of the scheduled learning circle meetings. And at the end of each session, faculty share their end product at a showcase event. And now I'd like to just share a little bit with you as well about the process of the learning circle model. Faculty create unique and individualized work plans that, they, that have a designated section within the work plan for weekly journals. Here faculty make notes to themselves on resources, questions, plans for future work, and anything else that they might want to save or note for, um, for future time when they perhaps maybe want to come back to some resources they found or whatever. And this plan is a tentative work plan that truly evolves as faculty work. Often right after the first week of the plan, they will find that they're changing that plan a little bit. It gives faculty a tangible scope and sequence for their work. It lessens their anxiety about project completion, and it holds them accountable to a self-designed work plan. Faculty also have access to optional weekly discussion forums where they can ask peers for help, share ideas, resources they have discovered, and of course, their weekly pearl. But beyond OER, we have found a hidden pearl in the learning circle model. And that hidden pearl is the personal professional growth that for each faculty member continues to pay it forward to themselves and to their students far beyond their work in adopting and developing OER. What we have found is once faculty can break free of the dependence that they had had on commercial textbooks to dictate the structure, organization, and the heart of their teaching, and they take that back and embrace their newfound confidence in themselves as experts in their field and experts of their profession. They grow and grow and grow in their renewed confidence in themselves and in their profession. So right now I'd like to introduce Kate, or ask Kate to introduce herself. She is our first of the six panelists that will be sharing their stories with you. Kate, do you want to take it away? Thank you, Karen. My name is Kate Brow, and I am health and physical education faculty for Hibben Community College. I have revised online and face-to-face -face courses as OER. I have trained as a learning circle leader and am now leading my third learning circle for our district. I possess two master's degrees, one from the University of Minnesota Duluth in education and one from Minnesota State University Mankato in community health. I still enjoy spending time with my family and when I'm able, I love coaching a youth boys basketball team. Next slide, please. So much work on OER and learning circles had occurred prior to our story at Hibbing Community College, but this is an opportunity to share our growth. I'm choosing to do this through Lego people. I've learned that Lego people can be very versatile in depiction and communication, and clearly my children are seeping into my work. So our story at Hibbing Community College is OER learning circles began with one person, and that person happened to be me. That's me, the chicken Lego person, uh, unsure of what learning circles were, but as an email came from Dr. Karen Papula and our system office, I was intrigued and felt compelled to participate. What I believe you'll hear ahead in our presentations is the phrase jumped in, and I did the same in regards to these opportunities. So for the many reasons why OER are adopted, those were mine. And I was, as I was participating in our Learning Circles project spring of 2018, I recognized that this work was meaningful. And I knew others were beginning to recognize this as well on our campus. As I was participating in the Learning Circles project offered by Karen in the system office and communicating the value of this project at our campus, 
This inspired our library technician, Rachel Milani, to complete a 10-week Creative Commons certification course. So now we have two people. Then we decide to form a committee. Now we have 10. This committee included interested faculty, which organically resulted in additional OER adoption, but growth was happening. We also garnered administration support. So here we were establishing this team effort at our campus. But now what? It didn't feel sufficient. There was an innate sense to have this continue to grow. So then again, there was Karen and the system office announcing opportunity to train as a learning circle leader. And this made sense. This was going to permit an effective mode for course redesign at our campus. I would be able to lead these efforts on our campus and offer support to faculty as they needed. This also allowed for us to instill another level of confidence for faculty to participate. Learning circles were not new. They were already being offered by Karen in the system office, but this offered a way to offer that same opportunity on a more personal level or from the ground up, so to speak. So in addition, we were awarded a large innovation grant by the system office for our learning circle project proposal, which provided additional incentive for faculty to participate. Next slide, please. So how are we effective? Are we still growing? Today, we are in the middle of offering our third round of learning circles and have faculty participating not only from our college, but also within our district. So this is demonstrating continued growth. Now, I've got some stats here that I'm going to read to you, but they are important. At Hibbing Community College, the average cost of textbooks for students is $1,050 per year. That's equivalent to the cost of two three credit courses. To this point, HCC students have saved over $236,000 thanks to new OERs that were adopted at our campus. So now in the case that may not sound like a lot of money to some colleges, we're a small campus with a current average of under 400 full-time equivalent students. So for us and our students, this means an enormous amount of savings. So as you can see by the Lego image I'm sharing here, it's a Lego robe. We have this system established now on our campus and it continues to grow. So my point in this presentation is this, qualities may start small, but can grow and small can still mean big things. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And now Mark, I'm going to see if you would introduce yourself and share your story. Sure. I am Mark Kaczynski, a biology faculty member at St. Cloud Technical and Community College in St. Cloud, Minnesota. And I've been working there for the past eight to nine years and have been using OERs for many of those. In fact, I started using OERs in my biology class as soon as I could get my hands on the OpenStax biology textbook. And that might've been 2013 or 2014, I can't really recall. Uh, initially, I started using these open educational resources in my classroom to help reduce the cost of my class to the students taking my class. Um, as I've gotten more comfortable with the use of OERs in my classroom, um, that my reason for using them has changed and now it's kind of geared more towards the freedom that I feel like I have when I use OERs. I'm not tied to the publisher textbooks. I don't feel like I need to follow the, the format that they have laid out simply because my students have purchased a $200 book. And today I just want to talk briefly about my experience with the learning circles and how that experience has helped me grow as a professional and has helped me help others grow as a pre professional. So let's jump in and go through my timeline with learning circles. Next slide, please. Like I mentioned previously, I had dabbled with OERs and have dabbled with them for quite a bit. Um, however, after using them for a couple of semesters, I did switch back to a traditionally published textbook because I lacked the confidence. Karen mentioned that one of the benefits of learning circles for faculty and everybody involved is confidence. I didn't have that when I first started with OERs and that made me shy away. And I switched back to using a traditionally published textbook because 
it, it made me feel more comfortable in the classroom. In spring of 2018, I saw an opportunity from the system office to participate in these learning circles. And I thought that would be a great way for me to become more comfortable in the world of open educational resources. I felt that it might help me expand what I wanted to do with OERs. And I felt like it might increase my confidence and my ability to effectively use them in my classroom. So I jumped in and I participated in learning circles for 10 weeks in spring of 2018. During my time as a participant in learning circles, I worked on developing ancillary materials for the OpenStax biology textbook. I decided to work on that project because from my own personal experience, one of the things that kept me from truly diving in headfirst with OERs was the lack of supporting materials. Those materials that you would typically get from a traditional textbook publisher like PowerPoints or test banks or study guides or assignments really do go a long way to helping you as a faculty member feel more confident in what you're doing. So I worked on developing vocabulary guides. These are tools that students can use to help understand course material. And then I developed presentation tools, PowerPoint files for faculty and test banks for the OpenStax biology textbook that are easily importable into various learning management systems. So that was my way of increasing my confidence and my ability to work with an OER in my classroom and hopefully share something with other faculty that maybe were thinking about making the jump but needed a little extra push to switch to this open educational resource. Fast forward a year to spring 2019, I saw an email again from the system office um, identifying an opportunity to participate in the Learning Circle Leaders Program. I thought, great. I had a good experience in my learning circle as a faculty member. I'd like to learn how to run one of these on my campus. After my participation in this learning circle leaders program, I now had the confidence in myself to talk with faculty on my campus and say, hey, come work with me if you're interested in incorporating open educational resources in your classroom and uh, I'll help you do that. So we started an OER group at SCTCC, and initially that started small with colleagues in the biology department. I was able to assist four faculty change from, to, to change from a traditionally published textbook in biology to the OpenStax biology textbook. And that made quite a difference for students taking our general biology course. Uh, and then it has since expanded to other disciplines on my campus. I've worked with members in psychology and English and even some faculty members in the trades uh, to help them understand the processes behind adopting an open educational resource for use in their classroom. That next fall, I can, decided I wanted to continue my work with OERs and I built on my experience in the learning circles to develop additional ancillary materials for the anatomy and physiology OpenStax book along with the microbiology OpenStax book. So I, I took my newfound confidence from participation in the learning circles and learning circle leaders program to develop more materials to share with faculty who are thinking about making a switch. And finally, currently, I'm participating again in the learning circles um, to redesign a course. And my goal this current session is to redesign a nutrition course around the use of open educational resources. On our campus, this is perhaps one of the most popular courses we offer in biology. And the current textbook is about $200. So my goal right now is to develop a course that I can share with other faculty on my campus to dramatically reduce the cost of that course to our students. And if I have to leave with one word today or one thought, it's that my participation in these learning circles and the learning circle leaders program has really made me find confidence in my ability to use open educational resources and help others find open educational resources and develop those for use in their classroom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, we're gonna move on now to Monica.
Monica, would you mind introducing yourself? Good morning. I'm Dr. Monica Rothe, and I'm an associate professor in social work at Metropolitan State University in St. Paul, Minnesota. I have taught for over 20 years, first as an adjunct, then as a full-time faculty, in addition to continuing my social work practice. One of my greatest concerns over time has been the increasing cost of textbooks. This brought me to the world of OER, and I began to attend OER-specific conferences and support OER work in my role as Associate Dean and Director of a Campus Teaching Center. Next slide, please, Karen. When I began teaching social work full-time about two years ago at Metro State University, I began to search for OERs specific to social work. It's important that OERs are developed for our field as they increase access, lower costs for students, as we all know, but they really serve as professional resources, particularly to alumni who are early in their careers and also studying for their licensure exam, which is required in many states. Um, many students don't keep texts as renting them costs less, but this means they don't have those resources as they begin their careers. I was pleased in my first semester to find that Minnesota State really supported the development of OERs and applied to be in the spring 2019 learning circle. For this first project, I worked with colleagues in my social work department to adopt a social work research OER, which was developed by Dr. Matt DiCarlo for two courses. I revised these courses and developed ancillary materials. We implemented the changes in summer 2019, and that went really well. After completing the first project, I then began to think about how we OERs could be used for our senior capstone course. This course integrates content from across the curriculum with a final internship before students graduate. I was accepted into my second learning circle for the spring while I was to actually develop my OER and then implement it this summer in the course that I'm teaching. However, I was also teaching the capstone course during the spring. I had finished four modules, then the pandemic hit. Because we moved online, these modules were implemented immediately. As you can imagine, many students were anxious as they neared graduation, but shared that the modules provided concrete and useful information that they could use as they began their careers. Now my OER is nearly complete. I have implemented it in the summer class uh, with additional content. Students have been invited to share their reflections and, and ideas in the OER, which helps them see themselves as learners, teachers, and social workers. Next slide, please, Karen. I'd like to talk a bit more about the Learning Circle because I found them incredibly supportive and encouraging this spring. Um, with the pandemic, uh, I, as many of you probably did, experience some hesitation and some um, being, feeling overwhelmed. With many of the aspects that Karen shared, such as the pearls and the plan, it helped me stay motivated and accountable. I connected with faculty from other professional programs when developing OERs, um, and they, this included like law enforcement and, and those type of programs. As a result of the learning circle and my participation, I created clearly defined learning outcomes related to the content and internship, design learning activities that can be done independently, such as a job search, and incorporated in the internship. Um, identified a number of different tools in developing my own OER, and I landed with Pressbooks. Began to think about student perception of OERs. What I am finding from students is they tend to like OERs because they are low or no cost, but that doesn't mean that they value it the same as a price textbook. And my next steps are to engage in research related to this. I have loved the learning circle, particularly the spring, and I found it a very um, motivating and encouraging uh, model. So I highly recommend it. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Dan, would you like Hello. to introduce? Uh, my name is uh, Dan Alasso. I'm an assistant professor of history at Bemidji State uh, University. Uh, where I teach U.S. and modern world and environmental history. So I get to wear um, a lot of hats. Um, I was an author before I uh, went back to grad school and, uh, and became uh, a historian. Um, and I've been involved in uh, OER and um, the learning circles over the past three years since I joined uh, Bemidji State. Um, my, I'm, I'm sort of the exception to the three uh, categories that uh, Karen listed out. Um, I, my interest is really sort of full on uh, textbook authoring. 
And uh, so please advance the slide, uh, Karen. Um, I, I also um, have been a blogger for a long time. I'm currently blogging at danalasso.substack.com, a little self-promotion there in case anyone's interested. Uh, but what I, what I did uh, initially was I took over a, another uh, instructor's modern world history course and the, the textbook had already been selected and purchased and it was a $150 textbook with a $50 additional reader. Um, so one of my immediate goals in my second semester on campus was to eliminate that textbook uh, and save my students $200 each, or basically $15,000 per semester. Um, and my initial thought was to do a sort of a course pack with public domain and uh, fair use uh, materials. And then ultimately I uh, discovered OER and I thought, well, I could just do a complete replacement uh, textbook. So my first project sort of morphed into um, switching from that redesign to an actual full-on textbook project because I already had a textbook that I had designed and developed myself um, that I thought would be easy to port to an online um, form and a freely available open licensed form. Uh, so that was my first project. Um, and so that was a, um, a project where I learned about uh, Creative Commons and I learned how to use Pressbooks and uh, designed this textbook, put it up on the, uh, the open textbook library uh, where it was um, fairly well received. So that was very um, encouraging. And uh, so I re uh, I re-upped for another learning circle to continue that process and to actually create the uh, world history textbook that I had originally envisioned. And I decided to do that in a collaborative way with other instructors. So I have a partner from uh, Southern uh, Minnesota University who uh, is co-authoring a world history textbook with me. Um, and I may have more to say uh, later on in the discussion about the, the collaboration project. Uh, but uh, that was an additional um, project. Uh, and one of the things that I do want to say about, um, about Monica's earlier comments regarding the way students uh, perceive open texts. Um, I was, uh, I took the, uh, the OER learning, uh, the, the leaders learning circle as well. And although I haven't begun leading uh, sessions on my own campus, I did become an advocate on campus. And I did talk to deans and the provost council and whatnot about OER and um, some of the data that I brought, um, things like the Florida survey, um, did suggest that a lot of students like having a physical copy, whether it's free or paid for, they have a little bit more of a sense of security with something that they can highlight and write notes in the margin and whatnot. So in order to, uh, to sort of provide that level of engagement, I um, found another online free tool, Hypothesis, which I use to have my students, I create um, private course groups that the students can, um, in that sort of protected environment, uh, do their their highlighting of the text and do their annotation and um, and that way they get engaged in the text in the way that they would a print text uh, so I think that goes a long way towards uh, sort of making the open text if they are reading it online um, a, a more real thing to them my text is also available in addition to online uh, I tend to make my text available in a variety of different formats so that they can download them, print them. Um, I do have some experience in creating print. Uh, so I will be exploring that a little bit more. Um, I've also begun exploring um, video and podcasts and other um, sort of other types of media that can enhance the, uh, the student experience. One of the things uh, that is a nice feature of the Open Textbook Library is the opportunity to have peers review. But as I'm in the, the working process of writing these texts, I find that it's helpful also to have students review. So my secret goal with Hypothesis actually is to have my students interacting with the text so that not only can I give them credit 
for interacting with the test, but also I can see what's working and what I might need to work a little bit more on to explain better um, or to edit. Uh, so I get that kind of real-time feedback um, in the sort of second draft, third draft phase before I'm ready to, to kind of put a, a done sticker on it and load it up to the, uh, to the open textbook network. Um, one of the, th my point, I guess my uh, message for this is uh, that this is a highly iterative process. And my most recent project uh, is one where I am actually for the first time um, remixing an existing open text. Um, there are a couple of US history texts. There's an OpenStax one, which I've used. And then there's the American YAWP, which is um, something out of Stanford University, which has a whole host of authors and editors. And I've decided that that was going to be the foundation of a remix that I am uh, creating that I'm also, um, I'm adding to, I'm editing some of their stuff. And, um, and so that I, I hope that people will um, use and adapt and, uh, and remix my stuff in the same ways that I am doing uh, with things that, that come before me, because that's a very exciting uh, process. And this, uh, this real-time iteration and the ability to, to update things and to improve on texts um, in much less than the couple, three-year editorial cycles of, uh, of professional publishers, I think, is a huge value. So. That's my story. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dan. Carolyn, would you like to introduce yourself and tell your story? I'd be happy to. My name is Carolyn Weber, and I am a seasoned online faculty from uh, Minnesota West Community and Technical College in Southwest Minnesota. Um, I'm part of a large system. I've taught at a number of different colleges in the Minnesota State System, and my background is in communication and ag business. Um, I'm really interested in things like OERs and virtual reality and quality online course delivery. And I serve as the lead for our um, campus academic technology team. I'm the cat woman at our campus, and um, also a mother and a grandmother. <clears throat> and um, to many humans actually and uh, I have a new puppy so hopefully he's not going to get too noisy during this presentation so what's my OER experience um, if you could advance the slide please it's a process and you've heard from a lot of my colleagues about what they've been able to develop as a result of these learning circles and I would just really like to focus on what it is that I experienced with the learning circle. Um, just a little background. I work for Minnesota State and there have been a plethora of uh, opportunities in faculty development that have coming down from the system. Uh, and I was just thinking, wow, there's a lot of stuff here. And so when I heard about learning circles, I went to Coffee with Karen, which is one of the introductions to what learning circles are. It's like, well, what is this? Um, and I found out. And then, um, like Kate mentioned, I tend to be a plunger. I thought, I'm just going to get right in there and find out. And my confusion led to immersion. It's just like, just jump in, find out what this is about. We got a small um, Z degree grant for our campus and we're working at developing those Z degrees. But what I also found is this um, energy that was in the learning circles. At first, I, there was this apprehension that thought, can I do this? What's out there? I started looking and digging and thinking, what's out here in, in communication? I looked in um, public speaking texts and um, interpersonal communication text. And what I ended up doing was redesigning my public speaking course and loading that up into Opendora. What I really liked was the um, encouragement that I got from Karen. And um, at, she talked about finding that um, sense of professionalism and losing that sense of 
having to be dependent on that purchase textbook and really being able to identify my own expertise. I found some really excellent OER materials in the Open Textbook Network and adopted one for my um, course, but I also added my own, my own flavor um, to those. And what's exciting for me and what I like about this process with OERs is that it is an evolution and it's not set in stone and it can continue to um, evolve into um, the next thing without having to wait for a new textbook to be published. And so it's become a learning experience for me. And um, I was considering the R word, you know, I'm at a place where retirement might be an option. And I can tell you that after this life changing experience for me in this learning circle from the encouragement from Karen and also connecting with other um, colleagues, there was just a, a, an energy that came through that. And I'm so excited to be now in another learning circle um, as a leader and to bring this to my campus. So what's next, I'm not sure, but I do know that I will continue to embrace and learn more about OERs in the future and um, be able to continue to be an advocate as well as somebody who shares these materials with my colleagues, only, not only at my campus, but across the system. And so thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Nick, would you like to introduce yourself and tell your story? Yes, thanks, Karen. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's truly an honor to speak with you all today. Uh, my name is Nick Heiser, and I'm currently a business and computer instructor at Central Lakes College. And um, one thing I'm most proud of is I successfully survived my first year um, as a full-time instructor um, at CLC this year, so I made it. Um, and before uh, being an instructor at Central Lakes College, I have served as an advisor, a supervisor, an administrator, an adjunct faculty, and then I'm in my current position. And I have to tell you that one of the best experiences I've ever had in terms of professional development has been these faculty development learning circles that uh, Karen has shared with you today. And I think that's really because of three things. Uh, they provide accountability, community, and the space and opportunity for everyone to learn. And the way that they intermix those three, I think is what's most crucial and has been most helpful to me. But before I share any more about these learning circles, I think it's important to tell you my story and how they impacted me. So as I said, this was my first year as a full-time instructor in business and computers at Central Lakes College. And um, I have to tell you also that other than COVID-19, the biggest challenge being a first year instructor wasn't working with students. And why don't we advance the next slide, Karen? Um, wasn't working with students um, or worrying about classroom management or prepping all new classes. It was dealing with the textbooks. Now I was, I was hired about three weeks before the semester started. So I was hired pretty late in the process. And I still remember this. Um, the, one of the first calls I received in my new role was from a staff at the bookstore. And she had a question for me. What textbook do you want to use, Nick? Well, because I only had about three weeks and I knew that um, previous students um, had probably already purchased the textbooks that was used before, I asked the bookstore staff member to use the textbook that the previous instructor had used. Thought that would be my way to start and I would just start uh, going from there. But then she asked me the next question. Well, which version do you want to use? We have the old version uh, that's been used for a couple of years now that um, we may have enough used copies for all the students. Um, but if you use the um, used version, you may not have access to all the course materials from the vendor. Or you can use the, the new textbook, which costs more. And we can't, of course, buy have used versions for textbooks, so it costs them more. But you can have access to all the course shell. And once I made my decision on textbooks, I also had the challenge of helping students navigate um, with access codes or usernames and passwords uh, to get access to all the online materials. And some uh, didn't have the funds to actually purchase the textbooks. So they were uh, flying blind, so to speak, um, without able to access some of the crucial course materials that they really are required for the course. So that was my first challenge. And my next challenge was, I felt as though oftentimes I was actually shackled by the textbook. I was really more of a textbook Sherpa. 
and I was guiding students through the textbook, modules in the textbook, resources from the textbook, instead of really teaching my students um, what I really knew that they needed. Um, we have a fairly rural population base, and so providing students with experiences and information relevant to them didn't always occur with the textbooks that we had. And then I got an email from Dr. Pakula about these learning circles. So as a first year faculty, I said, what the heck, let's, uh, let's enroll. And they completely changed my perspective. Uh, Karen's learning circles really provided me with confidence and a lot of great resources and the opportunity to learn about fair use, about copyright, uh, about the concepts like open pedagogy, and really um, the multitude of, of OER resources that, that were available. I had no idea the uh, sheer number of resources that were available to instructors and faculty to use with students. And in addition to showing me about resources, they um, really engaged me in a community of support to allow me to work through my stressors and my struggles and to hear other good ideas from more experienced professionals or vulnerabilities and concerns from faculty just like me that were trying to figure all this out. And in addition to that, they held me accountable to help me complete my work. Um, but in a way that I had set my own, uh, my own steps, my own challenges that I needed to reach. So it was a very comfortable and easy and, and, uh, and, and anxiety, not, not anxiety prone uh, experience. So it was one of the best experiences I ever had. And it really allowed me, I think, to transform as an instructor, not just to be a, stage on the, a sage on the stage or a, a textbook Sherpa, but to really be um, a, an instructor who facilitated learning and uh, was with the students in a learning community as we really worked through and learned about some of the content from these resources together. So what results have we achieved? Well, I'm all in as it relates to open pedagogy. I've re redesigned one course so far that I'm now using this summer um, and it's working out just great. And I have another course redesigned on the way. And my goal is to convert all of my classes eventually to open ed resources. I've successfully authored my first OER textbook and I've become, I think, a bit of an OER evangelist on my campus. Um, I'm also participating in the Learning Circle Leaders Group that other panelists have shared. And my goal is to expand OER resource adoption among tech technical faculty in my institution. So as I said, again, um, this OER Learning Circle opportunity has been one of the most profound and uh, most helpful professional development opportunities um, in my professional life. And I'm excited uh, for the future and to share this um, with faculty and my students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Um, thank you, Kate, Mark, Monica, Dan, Carolyn, and Nick for sharing those stories um, with everyone today. We now have time to um, move forward with some questions and answer, uh, question and answer time. But before we do that, I'd like to advance just one more slide to show you that if you download the slide deck after um, the presentation and it will be available to you, we also have included all of our contact information in this next slide. And we're more than willing to visit with you um, and about any questions you have or help you if learning circles are something that you'd like to start on your campus or at your institution or system level. Um, so with that being said, uh, we're going to move back to this question and answer um, part of the session. And I think that uh, Tanya and Karen are maybe going to manage this for us. So thank you all for taking time to uh, spend this hour with us. Hi, Karen, this is Sarah. Um, I'm actually going to ask a couple of questions that are coming in from um, the Q&A function. And thank you all to our panelists for an excellent session. A few questions actually seem to be about, um, for you, Karen Pakula, um, and they really are about um, the structure, it sounds like, around learning circles. So there's been a few, and I'm just going to put them all together and let you uh, address them all. Um, so one of the first questions we got today was, um, whether learning circles are um, typically subject specific. Um, and they also were a number of questions that asked about um, incentivizing this program, whether faculty 
did this because they were interested um, or if there was a stipend involved um, in the program. They also were asking about the amount of time um, that is involved um, in, in managing this program, that one-to-one -one time um, and, and uh, pardon me, the one-on-one -on -one support and the time that goes beyond those weekly meetings. So it sounds like some people are trying to think about what this kind of program would look like on their campus. And then finally, the role of the circle leaders. Um, so I realize that's a number of questions, Karen, but um, if you could try to address them or if any of you have, have in other, other pieces to add. Okay, so we'll start with the first one um, in terms of if it's um, typically subject specific. And actually it is not. Um, faculty learn, uh, join the learning circles, whatever their content area is. And that's kind of the beauty of the um, collaborative piece of this is it's, it's an opportunity to faculty, maybe for the first time, to have the opportunity to, to engage across institutions and across content areas in talking about um, their work as they move forward with OER. And what it does is it raises a really, um, perhaps for the first time, a personal awareness and appreciation for other faculty and other content areas. I think specifically of, of myself. Um, for example, uh, when I started to work with um, tech ed faculty, and I realized that as a liberal arts faculty, I've maybe spent an hour a week per course in a course room face to face or several hours a week online with my students. And as, as I was um, talking, even as the facilitator and engaging with my faculty and learning circles that were working in the tech ed area, I realized all of a sudden that these folks are scheduled, you know, from eight o'clock to four o'clock many times, almost every day with their students. And it just gave me a whole new appreciation for the work that they do. And I think that builds some real networking within institutions and across systems when faculty can truly begin to appreciate and respect other faculty's work. So no, they are not um, a subject specific. Um, you can be in any content area and join the learning circles. We do um, pay stipends. We, we, for Minnesota State, we use release credits. Um, so we pay faculty 0.5 or about a half of a credit for the work that they do in the learning circles. And I, I would highly encourage you to, um, to, if you are thinking about doing this, to try and secure some funding to start your program that way. That being said, I can tell you that I've had several learning circle participants across Minnesota State who have joined and asked not to have the, um, have the release credits. They want to join the learning circles just for the experience and they have not received any pay for creating those um, OERs that they are sharing, Creative Commons licensing and sharing out. And actually, I mean, that that is like re almost reaching an optimal goal to think that faculty actually want to join these learning circles for the experience of that um, collegial work with other people um, collaborating across the system and and that experience and the opportunity to provide OER for their students is enough for them not that not that that those stipends aren't valuable though because i think we also have to remember and appreciate faculty's time and effort that they put into this and they are deserving of some um, compensation for that the time involved on the one-to-one -one support i have been doing this for a number of years and this model grew out of my uh, work that i was the research that i was doing for my dissertation on um, just learning theory and also a great interest that I have in teacher attrition and how teachers are trained. And so a lot of, of the, this model came out of that. And so the time involved, for me, it's, it's really evolved over time. And um, so I have a lot of things in place that I can use. But for the learning circle leaders who are training now to be leaders, I export my entire D2L course room for them to use. I don't have that Creative Commons licensed. And the reason for that is there, I want to, I want to be sure I uh, preserve the integrity of the model. 
And so what I really, my goal is to train other leaders to do this in a manner that has been very successful. And I want to preserve that integrity. But for those folks, I export that entire um, course room for them. So when they're in the learning um, practicum, learning circle leaders practicum, they actually get an opportunity to um, lead the learning circles, um, do the grading of the, uh, the work that's in there, which is really just submitted or not submitted. And then that one-on-one -on -one piece, a lot of that really happens to take place during that one hour meeting um, during each week, where as, as folks share their pearls, I offer advice, um, I review their plans um, during the week and I offer them advice there. So I would say that I spend, I don't know, a minimum of 10 hours a week um, reading pearls and, and looking at plans and giving advice just there. That doesn't involve some of the time that I um, just communicate with faculty as they text me and say, I'm stuck right here right now. Can you help me for five minutes? Um, but that seems to work well. So I think you can regulate that to, um, to how much time you want to spend. And then um, what was the last the last one, Sarah. Thanks, Karen. I think this is really helpful. Um, I, I think the last one was about the role of the circle leaders. Okay, so as a learning circle facilitator, and that is truly the key word, and I think Nick used it when he was talking, and, and I think that's why there's particular people that do this learn, learning circle leader role very successfully, and those are the people that really understand that difference between sage of the stage and facilitating. And that means letting go yourself of having to have control over a lot of things and allowing the participants, very much like when they create their plan, you know, I tell them week one, put down where you are right now. Week 10, put down where you wanna be. And then you fill in those intervening weeks and, and uh, uh, in a way that makes it work for you. You know your family situation, you know all of these situations that you have to schedule your work around. A lot of times I don't think that we think about that. That our faculty are human beings, they have lives, they have families, they have all of those cares. And that's how I've designed this model, is that this needs to work for them. We need to meet each of them where they are. So in learning circles, we usually have some faculty who start or are very frustrated because they feel like they're way behind because we have faculty in there that may have attended five learning circles. So it takes them a couple weeks to realize you are not behind. This is a process. This is a paradigm shift and it takes time to, to get there. So if you're confused and you're frustrated and you're anxious, you are exactly where you're supposed to be and we're gonna get through this and they do. And so I think it's, um, I think it's just, it's facilitating experts in their field. These folks are experts in their field, they're professionals, they know what they're doing. I am not experts in each of their content areas, so I have to let them lead me through helping them or supporting them because they know what they're doing. They know where they need to be. Sometimes they just need a little cheerleading and a little structure and a little accountability. And I think that's what the learning circles provide. Oh, Karen, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it's, uh, we have a number of, we have a lot of wonderful questions that are coming into the chat and most of them um, are very structural about the learning circles model. I am sharing right now the webinar that you did for the OTN um, earlier in the year that is just now into the chat. And I think, Karen, I'll be reaching out to you after this webinar to get some of the things that people are looking for um, that are on um, the incentives, uh, the prompts that you're using, um, and some of those pieces that people could maybe adopt at their own institution. Um, I think that there was also a few people that wanted to know, and especially based on what you were just saying, Karen, about being the leaders or facilitators, um, I'm wondering if uh, you have seen, uh, specifically, we're getting questions about whether librarians are included in the learning circles um, and, and what role they are playing, if any. 
And this is our last question. I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, we're going to have to close. This is our last question. Okay, so librarians have not typically joined learning circles, but I have to tell you that librarians are a core structure of the learning circle model. We cannot do this without librarians. And when I lead face to face learning circles, I always lead it with a librarian at the institution. We collaborate and we lead together. Um, in the virtual learning circles that I do across Minnesota State, I always ask faculty to engage with their librarians for their assistance on their campus. It is essential that librarians are involved in this. I want to very quickly say that I have created um, a very specific narrative about creating and running learning circles. I am working with BC Campus on that now as a guidebook. I need to get that done. But um, that will be available shortly um, to, um, to guide you through that process. I am willing to share that. Actually, um, the gal that I'm working with at BC Campus has uh, talked to me about putting that in a format where we can um, put it out there kind of as a, as a temporary thing and take feedback from faculty as you're starting to use it or you're using it in your system. So I want you to know that that is coming. And, um, and also you have my contact information. I am more than happy to visit with you um, about this. And Sarah, if there's any other way, I know we're running out of time here, um, that you can think that we can get these answer, questions answered for everyone, um, be, I'd be happy to do that. Thanks so much, Karen. There have been some great questions um, and I'm sure that more will come up. So um, hopefully maybe we'll, we'll pin you to not only take advantage of what you're doing with BC Campus, but also have you um, share some resources in the OTN Community Hub. I'm gonna pass it over to Tanya um, to close our session. Thank you. Thank you. And Karen, could you go back to the slide with your contact information all on it, please, if that's possible? Great. There it Thank is. You so much. Thank you, Dr. Pakula and panelists. What a wonderful session this was. We appreciate your sharing your expertise with us today on OER Learning Circles and how they've improved your instruction. Thank you, audience, for joining us. We want to remind you that today's webinar has been recorded and that and the slide deck will be shared in the coming weeks. You can subscribe to the Open Textbook Network's YouTube channel as well to receive a notification. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day.